board members. We're going to have a board meeting on August the 4th. Have Facebook video at 6 o'clock. And uh, hopefully here in the next couple of months we'll be able to get back together because this is getting old. Um, but there's not a whole lot going on, but we'll uh, get together and discuss and make, a, make sure we have a checkup. So 6 o'clock on August 4th. That's a Tuesday night. I think it is anyways. Um, youth group Friday night, 6 o'clock. We'll be outside, weather permitting. Uh, don't forget uh, with offerings that we have Milo Pennies back there, the jar is back there. And uh, we also have today our missions offerings. I'm going to give you a little bit of a missionary update. Although I'll say it's been kind of quiet on that front as well. Um, not a whole lot happening. Uh, and, and I'll tell you why when we get there. But, but there are extra offering plates there. And I put little notes in them so that if you're, you know, you don't get confused. You know which one's which. Um, and for you folks uh, that are watching in, if you want to send your tithes and offerings, uh, if you have a missions offering, you want to send that, just mark it. Uh, so it's identifiable, and P.O. Box 2, Jonesport is the address, and we thank you for everybody and their support. I think that's all the announcements, for now anyways. Our call to worship this morning is from James chapter 4. This goes along with the sermon and, and some of the things we'll be learning this morning. But James chapter 4, verse 7 says, Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter into mourning and your joy into gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord. And he will lift you up. Starts to sound really bad there, doesn't it? You know, grieve, mourn, wail. But it says, humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. We're going to come before the Lord and, and uh, sing a couple songs and worship here this morning. I got a, I've got a new medley I put together. We'll see how this goes. One of these songs may be completely new to some of you. That's okay. You can sit back and listen and hopefully enjoy it. Um, not sure why. Must be the humidity, but everything's sticky right now. Mm. Um, I'm gonna blame that on my mistakes. You know how that goes, right? We're gonna sing in the secret and then cornerstone. Why don't you stand with me?
Father, we are glad to be in your presence today. We are glad to know you, but we want to know more of you. We are glad to be together, but we want to see more people come to know you and be together with us. Father, we know that you are working in many different ways. We just pray that you would continue to empower us, pour your spirit upon us. Continue to humble us by your presence and lift us up with your glory. And Father, this morning we just pray that you'd open our hearts and minds to hear you in all we do. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. like everybody else, our missionaries have been interrupted in what they've been doing a little bit. Um, there was a, actually quite a few of them that had come home or planned to come home and, and kind of got stuck here. And so that's one of our prayer concerns with our missionaries is, is to be praying that they can get back to the respective fields that they want to be in. Uh, Robin and Yoko White, um, they are still in Canada. And uh, the last update I had this week from them said that they are finally getting out to see churches again. Last week was the first week out. Uh, so pray for them as they travel. They are at about 74% of their goal and uh, looking forward to hopefully when they can get back to Japan. So that's where they are. Um, Zach and Laura, last I knew, and like I said, some of these I've not had real recent updates. Uh, last I know, knew, they are in Canada. And uh, so we just be praying for them as they're kind of on hiatus, I guess, in some ways. Um, they were actually way back in the spring, early spring, late winter, they were actually planning on being here today. And I just saw that here as I was looking at things, and I'm like, oh, boy, it's amazing how plans change. Mm -hmm. uh, so just pray for them. Robin and Beth Churchill, uh, missionaries to Haiti, they are... They are in Canada, um, and they are also going through a transition period. Uh, Beth has come off of uh, full-time missionary status, and she's still volunteering with WISH in Haiti. Uh, Robin is still full-time status, but he's going to be phasing out over this next year, and uh, they're going to be done with Haiti, uh, I think it is, by next year, at least living there, <coughs> being there. Um, their plan is to continue to support WISH through some other avenues, and one of them is they, they've developed a charity that helps put money into their, the hands of the people doing the WISH projects. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. So I'll be praying for that adventure. <coughs> Excuse me. Carl and Deb are transitioning from Asia I forget what they were doing. And I could not find the update that I wanted for them. But we praying for them as they start something new. I'm not sure where they are in that, that whole thing. Hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. I don't know what's going on here. It must be the fans. Trying to get. Didn't we do this a couple weeks ago, Bill? We did. <laughs> I didn't want to scare people. That's why I left early. <laughs> I was fine down there. I got up here. I don't know, if it's, I don't know what it is. <clears throat> and then Mary Beth. Mary Beth, I think, is, is the one that's kind of, things have changed, but they haven't changed completely for her. Um, it's changed how she do things. She, do, she does things. She do things. She does things. Um, but she is, of course, working with the missionary kids and making sure that they are, you know, adjusted and have someone to talk to and uh, all that wellness stuff. She basically just moved online. And so she's been holding Zoom hangouts and, and calls and, and <coughs> checking up on the, the kids and stuff around the world or wherever they are. So that's a little bit what's happening with our missionaries. Um, I know I don't always speak for people, but I can speak for them saying that they thank you for the support that you give them. And... Um, We'll just keep praying for them, and no matter what's going on, we're going to have a special prayer this morning. Um, it's a weird world we live in right now. It certainly is. 
and uh, it affects everybody differently, but yet all of us in some ways the same. So, um, as we go to prayer this morning, what other prayer requests do you have? Phrases, updates, concerns. Uh, I give a praise. Uh, I talked to Todd Alley uh, yesterday, and uh, he said that his tumor is uh, shrinking. Oh, good. Wow. That is a praise. Yeah. We're going to keep praying for that. What else? I have a praise. My sister had her gallbladder out a few years back, but she managed to produce a gallstone and ended up having to have an operation, but she's doing well. She said, leave it to her. <coughs> I'm not sure how that even happens. <laughs> it does happen, though. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll pray for Stuart Banner, but he just got out of the hospital. Uh, something to do with his neck. I don't know what it is. He's, I guess he's been in there about a month. Okay. Is that Stuart? Donovan. Who's that? Stuart Donovan. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, we've been praying for Elliot Peabody. Oh, yeah. And last I heard, he's doing much better. Um, the doctor, at, the last update I had, basically the doctor keeps saying a few more days, a few more days. And, but at least he's, he's going in the right direction. Uh, so keep praying for him. Keep praying for Norma. Um, keep praying for Jeffrey. Buddy and Susan Mills. Okay. Joanne Kelly. She so fell Bruce down. Smith. She fell down her steps. She did her knee quite bad. She's had to have therapy. She's still in the hospital. She's okay. my age. She looks like a home. You know she broke in? Uh, they thought she had broke a kneecap, but our knee got uh, I guess they ruled that out, but she injured for both sides of her name. Okay. Let's pray for people in nursing homes. Not only that they be safe, but it must be so lonesome not yes. to be allowed to yeah. let people come in. Right. <coughs> yeah, the separation causes a lot of, a lot of problems there. Yeah. Somebody else said something when we started by Joanne. Orin, did you have somebody else you were... Uh, Ruth. Ruth uh, okay. Smith. Anybody else this morning? We keep Brad in prayer. <clears throat> okay. How's he been doing? Well, actually, I haven't heard for a while. I have to call. I tried calling. He didn't return the call, so. Mm. Trisha Malone, the one that Trudy asked prayer for a few weeks ago. She's doing very good. She had a PET scan last week, and the tumors and stuff are shrinking very, very quick. Good. She's doing good. The medication is working. She's not, you know, so nauseous and stuff. So she's doing good. She gained a few pounds. So she's doing good. That's good. That's good. What's well, good? We got lots of praises today, don't we? Let me pray for the states that are having this real bad up rise in cases. I have a son and grandchildren in Florida, and it makes me very nervous. Mm -hmm. I'm going to put it this way. If you can't find something to pray about in, this, in the world today, then you're not looking hard enough. No, you're not looking, you're not looking at all. I'd say the whole country needs prayer. Yeah. But yes. also yes. realize, like, like we've said here, there's lots of things to praise God for. Though. Yes. yes. Okay. Right? There's ways he's moving. It may, it may be little ways or seem little, but we all know that little things they can build into big things, and they spread, right? Yeah. Yes. And we have a praise. Our youngest uh, granddaughter is Supposed to be baptized, I believe, next, next Sunday. Sunday. All right. She's accepted the Lord and was old. the baptized. Wow. <laughs> so we're going up to it. Oh, I, I don't blame you there. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so many things to praise God for. Let's, um, let's go to prayer here. Our prayer chorus is um, Sanctuary. And uh, I'm just going to sing. There are plenty of places where they sing just a cappella. We can do that too. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. Thank you. 
loves and heals. That you are powerful. And you are personal. And so, Father, today we thank you for all that you're doing. We thank you for uh, salvations and baptisms. We thank you for healing from diseases as people are beginning to feel better. And we thank you for watching over us in this week, uh, just all the things that we've done. We thank you for being here and letting us be here. And we thank you for all that join us through many different ways. And Father, we thank you for just a chance to be a part of your kingdom work and all that you do. Father, as our hearts overflow with joy and thanksgiving, we are also reminded of those that have less to be thankful for, those that are struggling, those that need healing still. And uh, we rejoice with their victories and we pray for the challenges that are before them. And we just we think of Todd and pray for um, Elliot, we think of Stuart, we pray for Norma and Jeffrey today, uh, Trisha, for Buddy and Susan, for Joanne, as she's fallen. Father, we just pray for each of these that you would take and, and touch them. We think of Brad, we think of Ruth. We pray whatever they need today, that your hand would sufficiently supply it, and they'd be able to see your working and give you the glory. Father, we know there are unspoken requests that uh, people have that are close to their hearts, and we just pray that you give them wisdom and strength and encouragement there today. We know that there are situations around our country that need prayer. We have a lot of older folks in nursing homes that are probably feeling very isolated, uh, maybe even very confused of why people haven't been to see them. Uh, Father, we just pray that you would uh, give a clarity, give a, a peace of those that are there, that they would just brighten their day. And uh, Father, that uh, most of all, that there would become an end to this time of isolation. Uh, we pray that as people are in turmoil and unrest, and as there's protests and even riots, Father, we pray that you would be there to protect. Father, we know that there are things that need to change. We know that our nation Father, we also know that there are ways to do things and ways not. So we just pray that the right ways would come through and that people would seek change and, and do it in a way that is actually beneficial. And we also know that there are no change that comes that is without you and your influence. So Father, we pray that you bring change to of our missionaries today, Father, and as they are in as much upheaval, some of them even more, I think, than we are, I just pray that you would watch over them. Some of them were already <coughs> home trying to raise funds, and I just pray that they'd be able to get back out and, and do more of that, that you bring in the support that they need. And we pray today for Robin and Yoku as they travel around. We think of Robin and Beth and their family as they get go through this transition period and start a new uh, charity. Father, help them with the support to wish that they, can, they would be able to continue change lives down there. Um, we pray for Zach and Laura, for Carl and Deb, and for the, the work that is going on there. Um, we just pray that uh, transitions and plans and everything will come together for whatever needs to happen. I think of Mary Beth and many meetings that she's holding online and we pray that uh, they would be an encouragement to the MKs around the world. We pray that you would continue to keep her encouraging them and, and being that listening ear and that helping hand. Father, for all our missionaries, we just pray that in whatever work they do, that they would <coughs> feel your power and see your grace and move Father, we pray for us. 
pray for our, our church. We pray for our community. Pray for the things going on uh, just day to day. We pray for safety for fishermen and workers all over the place that uh, they would feel your protection. Father, we just pray that today as we open your word, as we look at, at Samson and his life, Father, that you would teach us. Teach us what you want us to do. Show us who you are and how we can become more like you. And Father, we thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. Our hymn this morning is Sweet Hour of Prayer. Sometimes you just can't beat the classics. <laughs> yes, Willis. I'd like to say that uh, who's burden us down, and sometimes it gets almost unbearable. Mm -hmm. We have to give it up to the Lord. That's true. If we don't find relief, we're in trouble, and He's the relief we need. That's true. Amen. Good word. So my batteries are dead, and the other ones are charging, and uh, so I guess my big mouth's just going to have to do it for today. 
We're going to talk about Samson today, and there was an immediate book that came to my mind. I've kind of enjoyed this book review. I don't know if you're enjoying it or not, but I'm enjoying it. And I, since I'm the one preaching, I get to do it. Um, but there was a book that immediately came to mind from way back, when I was in like middle school. It was a book written by Lawrence and Larry Crabb. It was a, actually a series. There were two, three, four books. I can't remember how many. It wasn't that many, but there was a few. And it was called Captain Al Scabbard. And it was written for middle school boys. And it was a series designed around this character, Captain Al Scabbard, who was kind of a... He wasn't a superhero, but he was a hero. You know, it, he didn't have superpowers, um, but he he taught a lot of character and faith lessons through his adventures. And each book usually had like three, four, five adventures in it. They weren't very big books. They were real quick, easy reading. But he would have something happen usually that he would feel God's power and nudge, and he would save the day. That's usually how it kind of happened. And he had, he had friends and stuff that were with him, and they were usually there. And whether it was saving a, a child or saving the President of the United States, he never compromised on what he believed to be right. And that was always the main thing I took away from it. I know I've got two of the books, or I had two of the books, but I couldn't find it. So that is what it is. But it was a lot of fun to read, you know, and... Um, I thought it just went well with our whole Samson lesson today. You know, because there was a strength that Captain Scabbard got just from being with God. And it may not have been superhuman strength, but there was a strength there. Today we're looking at Samson. And Samson was the strongest man that we have record of, from what we can tell, right? He did amazing feats of strength. He killed a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey. He ripped the city gates off one of their cities and carried them up the hill. And, you know, I mean, he did all these things. And we like that kind of stuff. You know what? If you really study Samson, you find out he was a little hot-tempered. <laughs> and he had some other problems. And yet God still used him in mighty ways. And that right there should encourage us that we don't have to be perfect. For God to use us, we just have to be God's. You know, we have to give ourselves to Him. Um, but we should always be working on making our character better, right? I guess my the thing I'm thinking about today as we look at this is the fact that God empowers His people for whatever it is. It may not be superhuman strength. It may be wisdom. It may be a creative idea. It may be the courage to stand up and talk to somebody about something. It doesn't matter what it is, but God empowers his people for what he wants them to do. We're going to look at three passages from Samson's life, kind of the beginning, middle, and end, if you will. Um, just because I didn't want to read like four chapters. I didn't think you wanted to sit here and listen to four chapters. If you want to go back and read the whole story of Samson's life, it's Judges 13, chapters 13 through 16. But we're going to take a couple of snippets and just kind of get an overview and uh, look at a couple things. In chapter 13, this is where we start. Judges chapter 13, verse 1 says, Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. That's a reoccurring theme in Judges, by the way. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and so the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. A certain man of Zorah, named Manoah, from the clan of the Danites, had a wife who was childless, unable to give birth. The angel of the Lord appeared to her and said, You are barren and childless, but you are going to become pregnant and give birth to a son. Now see to it that no drink, no wine, or that you drink no wine or other fermented drink, and that you do not eat anything unclean. You will become pregnant and have a son whose head is never to be touched with a razor, because the boy is to be a Nazarite, dedicated to God from the womb. He will take the lead in delivering Israel from the hands of the Philistines. Then if we 
jump to chapter 15, verses 3 to 5, there's a lot that's happened here, okay? Samson's grown up. Let's see. Yeah, Samson's grown up. He found a woman he liked. He married her. Uh, then he left her. And then he got mad. And this is, this is what happens, okay? Because, I mean, what do you do when... You know, the guy leaves and doesn't come back. Well, the father took the daughter and married her off to somebody else. And so he came back, Samson did, and found out that his wife had been married to somebody else. He got mad and he says, in verse uh, 3 of chapter 15, Samson said to them, this time I have a right to get even with the Philistines. I will really harm them. So he went out and caught 300 foxes. How do you catch 300 foxes? <laughs> I've always wondered that. <laughs> he tied them all tail to tail in pairs, and then he fastened a torch to every pair of tails, lit the torches, and let the foxes loose in the grain of the Philistines. He burned up all the shops and standing grain together with the vineyards and olive groves. So he just wiped out the whole harvest. So a little bit later, we know Samson and Delilah, right? Goes in and he finds it. He gets real close with Delilah, and she's trying to figure out the secret of his strength. And eventually gets him to confess what the secret of his strength is. You know, the, the whole hair thing. Mm -hmm. Was it really the hair? Mm -hmm. No, it wasn't really the hair. It was his dedication to God. It was that he was God's man. When he gets captured by the Philistines, they gouge his eyes out, and he set to, to grinding grain. Well, they decide to throw a party. That their enemy is defeated. They're throwing a party. And so it says, while they were in high spirits, they shouted, bring us Samson to entertain us. And so they went and called Samson out of the prison, and he performed for them. When he stood among the pillars, Samson said to the servant who held his hand, put me where I can feel the pillars that support the temple so that I may lean against them. Now the temple was crowded with men and women. All the rulers of the Philistines were there on the roof. And there was about 3,000 men and women watching Samson perform. Then Samson prayed to the Lord, Sovereign Lord, remember me. Please, God, strengthen me just one more time. And let me, with one blow, get revenge on the Philistines for my two eyes. Then Samson reached towards the two central pillars on which the temple stood Bracing himself against them, his right hand on one and his left hand on the other, Samson slid, said, let me die with the Philistines. And then he pushed with all his might, and down came the temple on the rulers and all the people in it. Thus he killed many more when he died than when he lived. So we go from birth to a childless woman to death by his own hand, really, but in revenge. Samson was an interesting character. He really was. Two things today. We want to look at Samson's purpose, and we want to look at Samson's problem. Samson's purpose, there are very few people in the Bible that we read about having an angel come and tell them they were going to have a child. How many can you think of? I thought of Abraham and Sarah, childless, almost 100 years old, and the Lord's angel, or the Lord, depending on how you read it, came to them and said, you know, this time next year you're going to have a kid. And they're like, Sarah did. Good, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I thought of um, Zechariah, the priest. When he went in to do his duties, and an angel was standing there and told him, your wife Elizabeth is going to have a child. And he was like, well, she's old. And didn't believe him. And what happened? His mouth was shut. He couldn't talk for nine months until John the Baptist was born. And then, of course, I thought Mary, Joseph, they both received angels. Right? Mary, you who are highly favored, you're going to bear the Son of God. Joseph, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. To their credit, both of them believed immediately and, and uh, Jesus was born. But I, I couldn't think of anybody else. So Samson is right in this very small group of births that was announced by a direct communication from God. That makes it very unique. 
God had a plan for this man from before he was born. I find that amazing. And it's a good reminder that nothing catches God unaware or unprepared. God knew the Israelites' sin. He knew the Philistines were oppressing them. He knew they were calling out. And over 40 years, it seemed like nothing was happening. But God had a plan. In Psalm 139, the psalmist reminds us that God is creator and how he brings new life about. It says, for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. God has a purpose for you. God has a purpose for every single person, everyone. And Samson was no different. He was created for a purpose, God's purpose. What did it say there? He will begin to lessen the oppression. He'll begin to free the people. He'll, be, he'll begin that, that battle against the Philistines. It's important to note, though, that was just the first blow in the battle. Samson started it, but it would take years and decades. I'm not sure exactly how long it was. But you went through Samson, there were a few other judges after him, then there was King Saul, and then there was King David, and finally in King David's reign, they were freed from the Philistines. Completely. That was when they finally saw peace. Years and years afterwards. But Samson was the only person created with a purpose. Every single, I believe, every single character in the Bible was created with a purpose. I believe that every person we see through church history was created with a purpose. I believe that every person that comes into the earth was created with a purpose. Look at the things that God shows people for in the Bible. People were free through actions of another person. Needs were met. Sick people were healed. More importantly, the gospel message was spread. Those are all purposes. Look through church history and we see the same thing. I mean, sure, there are names that we will never forget. Names like like Martin Luther, John Wesley, John Wycliffe, Jim Elliott, George Mueller, Mother Teresa, Billy Graham. We know those people had purpose because they were like larger than life characters, right? I mean, everybody knows about them. Well, not everybody, but a lot of people know about them. But it's just as important to think about all the millions of names that never made headlines that were faithful servants every day that they served the Lord. Because they had a purpose just as big as anybody else's. You and I have a purpose. The world needs people like us. The world needs our purpose. Hey, this is funny. After I got done writing my sermon, I watched a show last night. Um, called Mr. Iglesias. And Gabriel Iglesias is one of the main characters, well, the main character. He's a teacher in high school. And he talks to the kids in one episode about finding your true purpose in life. And it's, it's what you love and, and you know, what you get paid for and what you do well. And, and there's something else. I can't remember what it was. But anyways, there's four things that all come together to find your true purpose. He's trying to encourage the kids to find their true purpose and, 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 and do it. Isn't that what we need to do with God? Find what we're good at. Find out what skills he gave us. Find out what we really love. Maybe even get paid for it, but that's not a, I don't think that's a big thing, really. I mean, if you get paid for it, even better. I mean, I, I talk about how I've got two of the best jobs in the world. I get paid to study the Bible and preach and sing and, and, and help people. 
and I get paid to do it and call the ambulance. You know, I love both those things. And they say that if you find a job that you love, you'll never work a day in your life. Well, there's some days it is, but <laughs> just be honest. But um, but it makes it easier, doesn't it, when you love it? It's not, a, it's not dreadful. But we need to find our purpose. And there are some people that have trouble finding their purpose. Or we go through stages in life where our purpose changes and we have to kind of find a new purpose. Maybe something happens, we can't do things we used to, or maybe something new happens that, uh, you know, virus or something. We have to find a new purpose. But when we find our purpose, that's where we do the most good. And that's where we glorify God. God has created you with a purpose, a job to do, a task, a, something that you can do that nobody else can. And he will empower you because he always empowers his people to do what he wants them to do. But you also have to be careful because Samson also had a problem and we can have problems as well. Sometimes we're our own worst enemy, aren't we? And Samson's problem, well, he might have had a few of them, but I think his biggest problem was that we have an enemy out there that's common to all. Satan doesn't want us to find our purpose. Satan doesn't want us to do good. Satan doesn't want us to accomplish what God has given us to do. Because it helps us. It makes us feel good. It helps other people. But most of all, because it brings glory to God. And so Satan works tirelessly to battle against us. Every day is a battle. Our enemies are not like the Philistines that Samson faced. It's not a, a, a person that is right there in front of you that you can identify sometimes. But we do have a battle every day. Battle against temptation. Battle against sin. Battle against compromise. Samson was a flawed judge. Right? Book of Judges is all about those that judged Israel. They were, they were leaders of Israel. And he was a flawed judge. He accomplished his purpose. He began the liberation of Israel from the Philistines. But as I study through the story of Samson, it doesn't appear that he really did much else. And you look at some of the other judges, Gideon, Deborah, other ones that they seem to interact more with people on a daily basis. Samson was kind of a loner. Samson didn't hold court under a tree and, and help mediate problems. Samson didn't encourage people. He, didn't, he was just kind of a, a force to be reckoned with that went his own way. In fact, he really didn't seem all that interested in his kinfolk at all. If we look at things. Now, we don't have necessarily the whole record. But what we do see was that Samson had this love-hate relationship with the Philistines. He loved their women, he hated their men. <laughs> Am I wrong? His first chance at love was he went after a Philistine woman and married. That didn't work. The next thing we see in the Bible is that it says he went and stayed the night at a prostitute's house. That's when he ripped the gates off the city because they tried to lock him in. The third thing we see is we see Delilah. And as much as he loved the women, he hated the men because he was always fighting them. Granted, they weren't making it easy either. But I've seen people like that. They seem to get along really well with some people, and they really don't get along well with others. But they have that kind of polarizing personality. You either love them or hate them, literally. And they don't usually end. Samson's case, it ended up with him losing 
losing God's favor, losing God's power, being captured, being blinded, being forced to turn the grinding wheel and crush the grain. And that can be a sad end to a hero, except that it wasn't the end. Because that wasn't the end of the story. It doesn't stop there. God didn't forget Samson, and eventually Samson remembered God. This is where the story turns. And in some ways, the last few days of Samson's life are probably the best part of the story. Because I'm sure as he was standing there walking in circles, grinding grain, have you ever seen how that works? That's got to be boring. Whether you've got eyes to see it or not, you're walking in circles. I'm sure he had plenty of time to think and to pray. And sometimes we have to get to that point where there is nothing between us and God. Everything is kind of stripped away before we can truly come to grips with ourselves. And I'm sure that as he thought and prayed, he realized where he had made mistakes. I'm sure there was probably some confession going on there. And then when he's brought out to entertain the Philistines, he saw his chance. But he pursued it with humility. There was a it was a different Samson that day from what I read. I just got a different Samson than the one that was before. He wasn't quite so hot, quick tempered. He was resigned to the fact that God had a purpose for him and he was going to do it. That God would just show up. And he dealt the Philistines a deadly blow. And from that point on, there was <clears throat> constant conflict, but the Philistines never completely got the upper hand. And at least not near it right up. It's important to understand our shortcomings. We have problems. Every one of us do. If you don't think you do, ask your best friend or your spouse. <laughs> I'm sure they can come up with something. But it's important to know our problems. Because our problems are our weakness. They're our, our blind side. They're our, they're our what's going to get us in trouble. And that doesn't mean God can't use us. It just means that we need to know where the problem areas are so that we can give it to him and work around it a little bit. God has a plan for us, each of us. We have the power to choose what we're going to do and how we're going to act and react and, and how we're going to go forward. And it's so much better when we go forward with God's power than in our own. Because when God empowers his people, God's going to get things done. When we try to do it, we usually screw things up. So as we wrap up here this morning, Samson is an amazing character. Everybody would like to be strong like Samson, right? I don't think too many of us would like to say that we'd like to have the flaws that Samson had. Mm -hmm. Yet we all have our own flaws, and we all have our own strengths. And God empowers us to do the exact purpose he has called us to do. So my question today to think about is, what are your problem areas? What is God working on? What's he shaping? What's he, he fashioning? What's he, he smoothing on? And give that over to him again. And then what is your purpose? Have you found your purpose? Do you know what God has called you to do? And are you doing it? Because it's there that you're going to find true joy and you're going to see the power of God at work. Deal with the problems by humbling yourself before God and then go forward and fulfill God's purpose for your life. Let's stand as we close. Father God, we are so glad that you know us. You know us, our strengths, you know us in our weakness, and you still love us. You still have a purpose for us. So Father, help us to continue to be more like you. That you would continue to shape our rough edges, you would continue to help us conquer our problems. 
that you would continue to empower us to fulfill our purpose. And as we go from here, Father, that we would influence and, and encourage and help change others' lives so they can see you and so that you can get glory and honor and praise. Father, you are such a great God, and we are so thankful.